printing. I see a hand up here that I'm actually pretty terrified of just by looking at it. So we'll, we'll turn the time over to them and save your questions for the end, I guess. All right, I should be unmuted. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so my name is TJ. This is Erica. Um, we're in creativity and innovation services here at the Marriott, Marriott Library. Um, it's a new department that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so in our presentation, we're going to talk about uh, kind of what we've been doing with 3D printing here at the Marriott Library, um, and also talk more about the context of 3D printing on campus, because um, we're certainly not operating in a vacuum. Um, so we'll, we'll go over some projects that we're doing and talk a little bit about the educational initiatives that we're kind of trying to build as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the presentation uh, introduction. Um, and Erica's gonna talk to us a little bit more about what creativity and innovation services is and how it fits with the library collection. So um, let's talk about the creativity initiatives. Um, I don't know her. There's only one person talking to this thing here. Okay, okay. <laughs> so TJ's Ty and I will be talking about creativity and innovation <laughs> services. Hey, nice. um, and we formed a new department. We're all people who were working within the library, um, doing a lot of different services. But as part of this, it was to bring together kind of these these services. We're certainly working across different um, departments and throughout the library, and we're going to touch on that throughout the presentation. But this brought together the fine arts and architecture. Um, it brought in Justin from RGAS Services, who you just probably saw present. Um, we've also got audio and video services, and then we brought in 3D printing, and we still really are integrated and in working with um, our student computing services as we, you know, while we are identified under this blanket of creativity and innovation, which is really exciting because I think it is a really broad and, you know, there are all sorts of directions we can take it, it also is a way for us to remain really connected across the library. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the equipment upgrades that we've seen over the year. Um, so we gave a, a, a similar talk last year that just talked about how we kind of built the services and what things we were involved in. Um, so uh, you can see here we have uh, an enclosure around one of our printers. Uh, this, we've just been taking various steps. 3D printing is hard to do and there's a lot of variables and a lot of things go wrong and you have a lot of failures. So figuring out ways to kind of isolate the, the, the build environment to increase uh, the likelihood of a successful 3D print. Uh, we've just been kind of making little upgrades. So you can see um, the, the case here is something that uh, Daniel Marsh and I built in my garage. And uh, so this is kind of a labor of love. There's Dan with appropriate safety equipment working on a uh, saw that's older than both of us. Um, but I mean, I, I use this slide also to, to remind us that, you know, this, this is definitely like a, a collective effort. Um, so on the one hand, we're not the only ones uh, kind of doing 3D printing on campus. I think that's also important to note. Um, there, are, there, there are fabrication studios all over campus. There's a lot of uh, individual departments and researchers that, that have 3D printers. Um, so some of what we're doing uh, in terms of hardware is less important uh, than kind of the, the community that we're trying to, to build and encourage um, and the educational resources that we're trying to provide. Uh, so just just kind of building the skills in house, and then and then helping others to make you know equipment decisions and, and advising on purchases and and you know troubleshooting uh, things like that. Um, so the other the other thing to note is that a lot of our services, uh, you know, creativity and innovation services as a new department has to be uh, successfully integrated with other departments in order to be successful because we don't have you know we don't have a space of our own for this type of equipment. Um, so we're definitely working really closely with student computing services. Uh, all of our 3D printing services kind of run from the student computing services desk. So we maintain these, re these really strong partnerships. Um, also maintaining partnerships with uh, the other uh, libraries on campus, right? I mean, there's the Fab Lab, and, uh, the Eccles Health Sciences Library, uh, and they're doing a lot of work uh, that kind of is, I, I will say, a little more serious than what we're doing. We're, 
we're, we're, we're kind of like the, we try to be the, the broad filter that people can come and, and learn. And then, and then when we identify projects that really should be kind of taken up a notch, uh, we can kind of make those connections with people. And, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, so uh, this year we were successful in receiving grant funding for a pretty expensive 3D scanner. Um, so if we think of 3D printing in this broader context, you really have to get your head around the modeling side and the design side, um, being able to generate models and, and kind of uh, read the physical world. Um, so 3D scanning is really hard to do. Uh, this this uh, is an Artex spider, and you can see there's a patient there making a scan. Um, it's, you can also see the older scanner that we had uh, bought some years previously, and the new scanner is 10 times more expensive, but also 10 times faster and 10 times easier to use. So it's, it's uh, a lot better, um, but also you know, a, little, a little more pricey. So we were fortunate to be able to get one of these um, and, and kind of be able to make it available to everyone. Um, we've also been looking, so at the opposite end of the, the, the price spectrum, we've been looking at these really inexpensive printers. So how do we find a printer that we can afford to buy a dozen of and have you know, a workshop where everybody sits down at a 3D printer and goes through some curriculum and builds something in, in a short amount of time. Uh, how can we, you know, afford to build a whole lab of printers where everyone can come in and just and have access to printers? Um, up until this point, you know, we've, we've got three printers that are kind of in the knowledge commons and are available for anyone to come in and use, uh, but they're busy a lot and people are often turned away just because they don't know, you know, I mean, and scheduling them is really difficult too because you can't necessarily have someone um, you know, come in, they schedule a 15 hour block on the printer and their print actually takes 20 hours and the next person's there waiting for five hours. I mean, it's rapid prototyping is really not that rapid here. Um, so figuring out, you know, how can we get more of these machines? This, this is a Da Vinci Junior. Um, it was $350. Uh, there, there's some, some pros and cons here. It's very inexpensive. It has a decent sized build platform. Uh, but the materials are about 40% more expensive and they are DRM locked. So uh, the spool actually calculates how much filament is on, on the spool still. And, and it's, so there's, there's, you know, for, its, for all of its uh, pros, it has some serious cons as well. So we're still evaluating uh, some of this equipment. Um, we also uh, purchased a Form 1 resin printer. So this uses a UV, ra uh, a, a UV laser uh, to shine up through the tank um, and cure resin one layer at a time and it peels it off and sticks it to the upper layer. Um, lots of challenges here too. So this uh, kind of, we, we've, got, um, we've got eight printers now just, just as, a, as, as some context. And this is one of them, but this is by far the, the messiest and the most difficult uh, to get a successful print out of and the most expensive. Um, just it has a lot of consumable components. So the bed has a, it's a, it's a glass plate um, with some latex coating and it breaks down pretty quickly. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of issues there. Um, but you know, it, it, it still remains a valuable tool for us to be able to sit people down. I mean, you know, if, if somebody's interested in using this, I sit down with them and we talk about the pros and cons. Um, and also brings up an interesting uh, conversation about environmental health and safety issues. Um, so that's, that's something that we can go into as well. Um, resins are generally you know, quite toxic so figuring out uh, a balance between creating a safe environment for my staff and myself and the patrons and, and the other, you know, just, just people in the library, you know, they wander through the, the knowledge commons and it stinks like resin, like that's not gonna work for us. Um, so we're, we're definitely, you know, it's, it's a constant balance and, uh, and involves a lot of research. There's a lot of research coming out on this stuff too, so we're kind of trying to stay, uh, keep reading on things and, and stay, uh, stay moving. So a lot of this translates into how do we, uh, how do we, how do we kind of, help people learn about this stuff. We've got all of these printers and all of this equipment and it's still growing and, it's, and, and people want to know, you know, how can I use this? Uh, so what we're doing is we're building curriculum. Um, we, we've taught workshops in the past. This semester we realized that we really need to have like weekly workshops where people, because it used to be that we would say, oh, well there's a workshop coming up and they just missed it. It was last week and the next one's not for another month. And so they're kind of wondering how can I engage with this? Um, so we're expanding our workshop curriculum. We're, we're increasing the number of times um, we're also trying to build uh, online curriculum that really, you know, somebody can do a module and then use the printer and do another module and then try another feature of the printer and that kind of thing. Um, so just, just kind of creating, creating opportunities for people to grow and engage. And then what we see are people, people come in and, and that becomes the start of a, of a relationship with a faculty member who wants to, you know, engage in a, in a, 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 a 
project or has an idea. Um, so from, from building this curriculum, we've really seen a lot of interest in these projects develop. And uh, Erica, okay. Erica's going to talk to us a little more about those. Oh, that, sorry, this, so this is another slide about the workshop. So this, this was actually yesterday. Um, this is our uh, staff member, Mikio, and uh, he's just giving a, a presentation on the, the kind of hands-on printers. And so we have people come and we, we give them an opportunity to kind of learn the terminology, learn the, the pieces and what everything's called and what, how, you, how, you, how you make the machine do what it does, um, and hopefully give them an opportunity to you know, see a, a successful print. But uh, your first couple of prints are always a little dicey. So. Well, so along with that, um, we're talking about a lot of the relationships, and we want to touch on that. This continues to grow, not just as a service, not just as building resources, but also our relationships, either through sort of serendipity or intent. So we're going to touch on a few different things um, that have projects that have come up and are, are continuing. This one's inside the library. So this bronze statue came in with a collection up in Special Collections, and um, they wanted to document it because the donor would like it returned. Um, and so what we did, rather than, you know, having them do really thorough photographic documentation, we actually used our scanner and created a 3D object so that they were actually able to have something that really put the collection in context in the, you know, duplicate form. We have a fun little transition to show you the level of detail we were able to get from this. This was on the ProJet printer, so this is a powder print. It was pretty pricey and it did require some... Um, assembly, but it was a really fun in-library collaboration and a way to connect this service to some of the different identities that the library has here. Um, and from there, we move on to a little bit of history. Uh, so here we have a, this is a 3D scan. Uh, we've, the scan was made uh, of the bean using an iPad, so it's kind of a low resolution scanner uh, and the print, you know, came out pretty well. She's holding uh, what's called the Utah teapot. Um, so th this uh, is a, a basically a digital historical artifact from campus. Uh, we've got a long history of, of research that kind of went into the computer graphics industry and representing 3D uh, models in uh, digital space. Uh, so this, I mean, I, I couldn't quite tell you the year. I'm thinking it was in the early 80s uh, that this uh, teapot was first made and now we're able to print copies of it. Um, so the reason we really like this is because one of the faculty who was involved in, in kind of building uh, you know, the modern graphics industry is now teaching a course here on campus in, in computer science and it's called computational additive manufacturing, uh, which is a pretty fancy name for 3D printing. Um, although, I mean, additive manufacturing, can, you know, there's a number of processes that that includes, um, but she's, she's using the technology that we have um, and, and sending her students to us. So we've been able to initiate a relationship uh, with Elaine Cohen, um, and uh, it's, it's really kind of inspiring to work with this researcher who's been uh, instrumental in, in building the, the technology that now we're able to utilize uh, in math, so it's kind of a lot of fun there. Um, so not only, I mean, she, so she's teaching her students, like, what are the algorithms that go into, you know, uh, articulating a 3D model? What are the algorithms that have to go into a 3D scanner in order to actually you know, gain access to this? So, so we've got groups of students that are coming in and scanning objects and printing objects, and it's just kind of a constant, a constant back and forth here. Um, so this, this is a print that she handed out in class, uh, the, the first class of the semester. And this is actually printed in 1990. Um, so just to give a, an idea about the, the you know, I mean the, these processes have been around for so long. Um, it's just only recently that they've kind of hit the consumer market. So, I mean, the research has been going on for, for decades and decades. Uh, it's, it's just really nice to be able to kind of connect, you know, what we're doing kind of goofing off, you know, building prosthetics is, is neat, but, you know, the, the, the technology that this actually goes into has, a, has an academic history here on campus that it feels, it feels neat to connect to. Um, so, yeah, they're, and, and they're also using, you know, they're, they're, they're using a couple of our different printers to, to do uh, different kinds of testing and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so. 
Well, and along with that, so we have a nice history, we have a nice connection with the sciences, but we're also expanding. The idea of having this space in the library, this identity for the library, allows it to be really open to any different department or discipline. So this is a project that we're in process with right now with one of the um, College of Fine Arts faculty. She's a sculptor, and so we don't have any images of the original object, but she built things by hand, and she brought a piece in, and we used the Artec scanner to generate a model, and the goal was not to um, you know, replicate the work that she's doing by hand, she still wants to be very involved in the process, but to actually expand how she can make duplicates and um, really explore how she can use the technology to enhance her um, end goals in terms of an exhibit component. So this, we took the mold, or we took the model, and we're doing what we can to generate a mold so that she could be able to replicate the object in ice. She actually wants to fill these with water and then freeze it and extract it. So this is definitely, I think this is the second or third iteration. <laughs> there, it is not there yet, um, but it's been a really interesting way to sort of interpret and move through people who want to remain hands-on and engaged in their process, but also to integrate that. Um, and then going in reverse, we're also working with another faculty, um, Ed Bateman, who is in photography. And his background is actually really unique because he has a really you know, passionate love for the, hist the history of photography and, and historical photogra photographic image, but he builds it all from a computer end. So these are all entirely <laughs> computer-generated images where he's actually building a certain amount of mesh or mapping to create these images. Um, and what's really been fun about it is his, his, his thought process didn't take him from you know, 3D manufacturing or printing, but it took itself from a place where he was already creating these intense maps and meshes and, and things that could be manifest. And it dawned on him that he wanted these artifacts. And he could actually use the language of what he's doing to generate these two-dimensional images into a three-dimensional plane to get these artifacts. So we've just started working with him and it's a really exciting project. I think the first thing that came out was a robot finger which promptly was broken because it looked like it bent, but it did not, and someone bent it. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to start finding these moments of connection and to see all the different places that this is coming from. Um, speaking of that. Uh, yeah, so this is another, um project we've been working on, um, although mostly we've been staying out of the way. It's, it's, you know, sometimes we just get the equipment in and we train uh, a faculty member on how to use it and then we let them go nuts. Uh, so this is uh, Professor Kathleen Ritterbush uh, in geology and she's doing paleontology research. So in this picture she's actually scanning what's called a paper nautilus and I don't know a whole lot about what a paper nautilus is except that it comes from an octopus. So this is like a bizarre thing, like it, it extrudes a shell, I don't, I don't know. Um, so what she's doing is she's making 3D scans and then we print copies of them and then she can actually do fluid analyses um, in, in physical space uh, to kind of determine, um, you know, the, so they've got a lot of, a lot of fossils and they, some of them went extinct and some of them did not. And trying to figure out, you know, what are the factors that might have led to that um, and so they do fluid analyses to see if, you know, movement, the way they, the way they were able to move through the water, because they have all these different shells and shapes and features, and, and, uh, and that's, you know, the kind of, the, the, the math behind a lot of this stuff has already been sorted out, but now they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the, what's the impact of this on a, on a flow, and so they, I mean, you know, you can't just submerge a, a fossil, and the other form, I mean, it used to be, you know, you would hire a sculptor to kind of, you know, make a, a representation of these, and so now we're able to, do these translations digitally, and then also start to experiment. You know, well, what if we, you know, what if we take this and then compress it a little bit? How does that affect things? What if we, you know, what if we introduce some, you know, some damage to the shell, which would have inevi inevitably happened? You know, um, and so starting to simulate, um, kind of, I guess, uh, environmental success um, based on actual fossil data. Um, so that's a lot of fun, and it also, I mean, you know, this is the kind of thing we we have the equipment available. Uh, we train the uh, the faculty member, and then she brings in her own students and researchers. Um, so this, you know, she's she's uh, got UROP proposals that are written and has students lined up. Um, so it actually creates, you know, it's it's it's, its own self-sustaining thing. Um, a lot of times, this does turn into. Um, so this this is another <laughs> another faculty example here. Um, 
But what this stuff turns into is we end up showing people what they can do, and then their department picks up and, and runs with it, right? Um, so this is a 3D print of uh, an anaplastologist here on campus. He works up at Munson Cancer Institute, uh, and uh, he requested, so he has a CT scan of himself, so we've actually printed his skull and his face. He does lots of facial reconstructive uh, prosthetics, and so having, uh, having kind of himself to work on as a way to build his skills and kind of see what we can get away with with the technology. Um, so yeah, these some of the some of the most ambitious prints. You know, people send us files and we're just like, ah, this is crazy, and we have to figure out how to fit like a, a whole human into a very small uh, build box. And so we end up like, you know, you print the front of the, the head and the back of the head and the shoulders, and then you rebuild this person, and then he does what he does in his own uh, in his own lab. Um, so this is also uh, the same, this is the same uh, researcher that we've done a lot of work with, uh, where he uh, will send us models of the patients uh, where they, they might have a, an ear that's missing, uh, and then he can reconstruct an ear using this as a mold. Um, so there's, there's tons of work going on uh, in the prosthetics world. Um, these things we end up, sh we, we end up usually shipping out the coolest stuff that we print. So we printed a copy for ourselves of um, this is a prosthetic hand that we've been printing for another uh, clinical faculty here on campus. Um, there, I mean, it, it's it's a flexible material, and you, everyone's welcome to handle this. We'll pass it around. We have a lot more printed examples uh, upstairs that you're welcome to come and see as well. Um, but basically, this is a uh, it's a poor replacement for a hand. That's a very complicated thing. But if you have no hand at all, you can put actuators in here um, and attach it to electrodes on the arm and actually control the fingers. Um, they also put sensors in the fingertips to give some electrical feedback to start to uh, give the, the patient some, some uh, tactile response uh, with the hand. Um, this stuff, it's, it's moving really quickly. So uh, this is like, this is the iteration that we have now. Um, you can see it, there's a lineage of using different materials. So um, we've printed, so, so far we've, we've printed two of these for, uh, for installation. Um, and then one of the for uh, a child's, uh, well, his, his dad actually works in the building. Here. There he is, hey. <laughs> How's it going, dude? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I mean, this, this stuff remains, it's, I guess it's, it's a work in progress, but I mean, all we do, we, we have the equipment, right? And, and so the ideas come to us, like the researcher says, hey, I, I want to be able to do this. Um, after he printed two of these with us, you know, the, the conversation changed from, can you print this to me, for me, to how can I use this printer, because I'm just going to buy one for my own lab. Um, and that's what we're seeing all over the place. So, you know, there's, there's tons of printers coming online, and more and more, we're, we're more of a, you know, a, we provide kind of computation and that kind of thing. And, and maybe do the, the hard print jobs. People, people want to do really ambitious things with printers, and we try not to say no, we, we try to let the failure happen. Uh, so a lot of the work is just clean. Like this morning, we had an amazing mess on our hands. Uh, and but you know, like if, if you have the right approach, we, so we've dealt with a lot of messes. And when you take when when you've kind of seen it before, and I mean, it, it could be that we just have to throw the printer away. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but sometimes it takes a delicate approach to actually keeping things running. Um, I guess I could be, you know one of the challenges there is that we we let the students get their hands dirty. Encourage people to try things. Sometimes uh, we had one earlier um, this weekend and the week before where a, a print job came in and we said we cannot print this. You know, we said well, I'm, I, I, it's, it would take it would take several hours. So it was, it was like um, maybe 50 hours worth of printing, and for each six-hour block of printing, you needed to process and, t and spend about three hours taking these things out of the printer because they were so delicate. I said, I, I don't have the staff to do this. You're welcome to come in. You can submit the job. And you can take it out. And they did. And they learned a lot. And they realized that they were crazy. And it worked. So um, so all of these things happen. They probably, I mean, you know, th they wouldn't do it the same way the second time. Um, but the fact that they did it the first time was really kind of, uh, it was nice. And so, you know, we, we try to just make sure we're covering costs in terms of materials um, and not spending massive amounts of time uh, just doing very, very delicate work uh, when we can have the students come in and have that, have that experience themselves. So. Well, and so along with a lot of these individual um, 
collaborations and sort of you know small inspirations for other departments and involvement. Um, uh, for those of you who saw last year's presentation or attended last year's presentation, a lot of what we talked about were collaborations with organizations on campus. Uh, this is a newer piece that we did for the Natural History Museum. So this is a, it's probably about two inches tall, and, and you'll be able to see it later if you want to stop by, um, is the Denali skull. But we've probably printed, what would you say, about a dozen to two dozen um, large bone replicas for the Natural History Museum. We're up to about 30. Uh, no. Okay, so a little more than two dozen. <laughs> um, so that they, there's an opportunity for these objects to go out into the public school system, to um, get kids, the, give them the chance to have their hands on something where they can really make the connection between that object and the original fossil, which is a really fun connection. We have students come in all the time that see those objects and are like, I saw that in the museum. <laughs> um, along with the Natural History Museum, we worked with Pioneer Theater. And again, from last year's exhibit, there were some things we did with the uh, Utah Museum of Fine Arts where we printed very large scale items and had to do a lot of assembly. So this is about 18% uh, larger than the figure, and this was the actress from the performance of A Funny Thing Happened on the way to the, for on the, way to the forum, um, who actually came in, we scanned her, and she had the wig on and everything, it was pretty cool. Um, but we had to break this down into, I think, eight or nine pieces in order to print it at that scale, and then assembled it. Um, we may, be, may have done just a tiny bit of modeling, her mouth was not quite that stylish. Um, but then we turned it over to Pioneer and they added the texture and they touched it up and got it ready and it was on stage for all the performances throughout um, that show, which was a really like a fun opportunity. We've had other people from Pioneer come up and talk about it, collaborations or do some of their own work on their projects. And this is our smallest but most international print to date. Uh, we came up with the idea working with our international initiatives librarian to um, send something, she's going, she just left this last week to go to the Asia campus for the University of Utah that's in uh, Songdo. And um, these say uh, Republic of Korea at the bottom there. Um, and they're just about the size of a half dollar. And there is a whole set that just went for the new students going through orientation there. These will be little keychain giveaways to promote services at the library and relationships. Um, Along those lines, now that we are reaching out, we just keep growing and running into opportunities, but also challenges. And I think TJ's going to touch on where we're at with all of that. Um, so we've seen a lot of growth. Just, I mean, people, there's, there's more interest. We're getting more print jobs submitted. Um, more students want to come in. They want to know, how can I learn more? Um, a lot of this stuff, I mean, it, it lends itself really well to online instruction insofar as you can couple that with hands-on experience with the so we are working with CTLE to kind of, um, well, CTLE, CTLE and TLT to start building some online uh, learning components that will, you know, a, a student can sit down in front of a printer and go through a module and start to, to, to have some uh, incremental learning steps there. Um, we're also doing a weekly maker space that kind of just encourages people to come in. We bring out equipment. We bring out uh, 3D prints. I mean, you know, people, a lot of people aren't familiar with what's available in the library or even, you know, what, what else is on campus. And it becomes, it becomes an opportunity for us to talk about, you know, what, what services are available for people. Um, it's, it's, you know, be, because we are so integrated with the other departments, we don't really have a space where, where things uh, can, can start to grow. And so we're constantly kind of looking out for, for new ways to a, find affordable equipment, um, how, to, how to translate that into something that's functional and usable. Uh, patrons that come in um, and, then, and, and also make sense for the staff. And it becomes, you know, 3D printing becomes a really technical thing that, uh, I mean, using, using the machine is, is it's just like using any machine, but the, the connections between the model and the design and, and then the printing process, it's a lot to, to train, you know, a huge staff of part-time employees on. And so finding that the balance and the right connection points and that kind of thing, um, it just, it remains an ongoing an ongoing discussion. There's, there's increasing demand, and so we're looking at increasing capacity. Um, but without necessarily, you know, we, we're, this is a, a library, right? And so, like, a, a manufacturing space isn't really what libraries are about. Um, so we're, we're more interested in kind of teaching people about tools and, and, you know, some about the use of tools, but also, you know, just providing that, that kind of creative inspiration and, 
and hoping to create a space where you know people can come and ask questions and, and oftentimes you know we get these kind of serendipitous connections where where someone comes to ask a question just as we're you know having a conversation about something totally off the wall and those two people start talking and before you know it there's you know a new project that's come out of that um, so yeah I mean it's, it's I guess it's about it's about balance here right? so moving forward with equipment but also moving forward with uh, training resources, those, those things have to go hand in hand. So, um, yeah, we're um, welcome to, to hear your thoughts, or I'm sure you probably have questions. Um, this stuff is lots of fun. Well, along with that, something that we've been really grateful for is that we've received a lot of support from the library. Um, you know, they're seeing the need because we're able to illustrate the need, and in some cases, it really comes from lots of really fun and engaging projects where it's not a chore for us to show the value of these services. Um, we do have a quick little video that the library put together to promote um, our Friday event space, and then we can open it up for questions after that. Yeah, I might actually, I mean, this, you, you had a question? Yeah. Somewhat. So this stuff is, I mean, it's it's this stuff is exciting for a lot of reasons. But one of the things I really like is that the the the, the equipment is getting cheaper. The materials are continuing to diversify, uh, and the software is getting easier. Um, so the 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 combination of those things means that we're constantly seeing new materials come up. Um, the so this is printed on a, a, a basically an extrusion. You can think of a, a, most of our three D printers as hot glue guns strapped to a robot, right? Yeah, not all of it though. So this is this is called Ninja Flex, and it's very flexible, but also incredibly strong, right? So that you could run this thing over. Hey there, car Jordan here. On and it would, it would be fine. Um, but there's also so uh, the the two primary filaments that people are using are some form of styrene, so polystyrene or, or ABS, um, and then PLA, which is a natural, uh, it's made from cornstarch. Um, so those those are the hard ones. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's it, it does degrade. It's it's biocompatible and uh, biodegradable. Uh, biocompatible might be like a buzzword that I'm, I'm in over my head with. Uh, <laughs> it's not toxic <laughs> that that I know of, but um, that I know of. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing I mentioned earlier. This this research is kind of constantly like people are, are doing. I mean, there, there's definitely an issue with uh, ultrafine particle release. When when you heat up a styrene, it has an ultrafine particle release. You know, and of course, you know we have to abide by the MSDSs that, that are accompanying these things. Um, but some of those, I mean, you know, how, how far behind is that MSDS uh, in terms of actual, you know, health safety? This is it's called NinjaFlex. Uh, it's, it's some kind of I actually I don't is magic. Yeah. Um, but but there, I mean, so even with PLA, they've got they've got new flexible filaments coming online all the time. So PLA has uh, one of our colleagues, um, Mark Howell from Engineering. Also uh, gets into this stuff quite a bit. He's always kind of keeping us on our toes with these things. Um, he brought in some PLA that's been infused with some elastomer that actually makes it flexible um, because the you know the, the rigid plastics aren't aren't quite as uh, useful as the rigid plastics. Um, so yeah, the, the the materials they're they're proliferating. Right? We're seeing a lot of new materials, and some of them you know, I've seen coffee filaments, uh, wood, wood based filaments that are. Kind We tend to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, anything you can extrude can be printed, right? It's a matter of why. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's check out this video. They do keep asking us for a chocolate printer, but I, I'm pretty firmly against if I have to clean it, I don't want it. A beautiful Friday morning here at the Makerspace. Now, what are the Makerspace, you ask? I didn't ask, but... Now that he mentioned it, sure. Makerspace meets every Friday morning from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here on the second floor at this, this table behind me. You just, just come here. With our 3D scanners, you can scan objects and people. This, this doesn't have any side effects, right? right? Afterwards, you could print your scan, a design you downloaded, or one of your own. It can take a while for the 3D printers to work its magic. So while you're waiting, come out here and do the puzzles out here on the tables. 15 minutes. New record? No. 
is it now? Hope this video has helped you. Remember, the Marriott Library has all you need to succeed. I'm Jordan Hansen. See you later. Hey there, Jordan here on a beautiful Friday morning here at the Makerspace. Now, what are the Makers? We're fortunate to get to have a lot of fun doing this stuff. That's, that's one of the really nice things about this is it's an engaging technology that kind of people want to learn about it and it's, it's, it's interesting for them and, and uh, it creates this kind of fun atmosphere. And did you have a question? opportunity to study uh, the original form of the Iceman. Um, but 3D printing has completely changed that. And so this whole episode was about the process of creating a um, 3D replica of the Iceman that allowed for a much closer study of what this person um, history might have been. And it's very interesting, um, the program to watch, but he was uh, coming along at a time where Europe was transitioning from a hunter-gatherer culture to an agricultural-based culture. Mm -hmm. And so 3D printing um, has allowed us to re-examine things that might have been discovered a decade or more ago on a much deeper level than before. I do think we're a little bit away from being able to do that here because they had a huge 3D printer. But that kind of leads into um, a question for you all. What are your thoughts about how do, we, do you expand printer size in the future so that there's less assembly? Or what, is that a thought that that's been so I, th I think we can't have the nicest printers on campus. I mean, that's we don't we don't have the. I mean, those the really high end printers end up going in labs that have you know really big grants and, and really high end research associated with them. Um, so I think the the real uh, the real opportunity comes from us having those connections um, and creating those relationships with the people who do have access to those. Um, and this and this becomes you know not only do we have connections. Uh, internally on campus, you know, so a, patr uh, a patron comes in with a print job that might be better suited to a printer that's over in engineering, you know, we created a, we create a contact there. But also, you know, what if somebody, uh, you know, from, from the community comes in and wants to know, like, how do, I, how do I do this modeling? How do I get this printed? Having those connections with local businesses is also important. Um, so finding, I mean, we, we, again, we can't have all of the equipment, and, and I, I don't think we should, but Developing those connections uh, does does allow us to still help those people, um, but as a result of those connections, I mean, people, it's it's known that we have three D printers on campus um, and that we manage the services that are associated with them. Um, so we do have departments that are reaching out to us to say, hey, like we have this printer, um, we don't necessarily have the space for it, but we'd like to provide access to it. Uh, can we work together? And so we have a couple of partnerships coming up uh, where we'll be taking. Uh, taking on um, the housing of equipment uh, where then we'll have access to it uh, and it won't necessarily be ours. I mean, it's, there's, there's a whole lot of, you know, back and forth about that. Um, but so, so some of it is, yes, we'll get bigger printers, especially as they get less expensive. Um, but others, others it's, I think it's about building and maintaining those, uh, those relationships. Is anyone else in the audience besides Adriana and myself sure that this is the face of Benedict Cumberbatch? Is there any, are there any r real questions? <laughs> All of them, yeah. piece by piece. We'll, we'll drop them off. We'll have them delivered by the end of the day. <laughs> uh, <perfect. laughs> 
It does. It gets really. So I wore I wore this because it's a very thin shell, and so I was wearing it around the office. And there's some pictures of me floating around with that. It, it definitely like crosses the creepy threshold really fast. <laughs> I have, a I have a quick question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are some repositories or things on the internet that we could go to that, to find plans and different things? Are there more reputable ones that you would suggest? Um, I guess there's a lot of them. So uh, NIH, the National Institute of Health, has a repository for um, kind of medical, it, it's, it's, it's a, a blend of kind of um, biological features, so like nervous systems and organs and that kind of, and bones, but also lab equipment, right? So, uh, and we actually end up printing a fair amount of lab equipment um, for, for researchers on campus um, that comes from NIH. Um, Thingiverse, uh, you said reputable. Uh, I don't know how, you know, I, I don't know how to judge these things. There are, there are lots of repositories. So uh, Thingiverse.com, repables.com. Uh, they all have their associated licenses and things. A lot of them are Creative Commons. Um, there's Yegi, Y-E-G-G-I, -E -G -G is another uh, repository. But then a lot of them, like uh, this, this hand is uh, put out by a company called, uh, well, an organization. I don't know if they're a company or not. Uh, it's called Open Bionics, and so they released the plans to to build this. Um, you know, but at this point, the the print becomes a smaller portion of it than the rest of it. So you know, the specific actuators that this is built for, and the electrodes and the placement of them. So they actually, they provide guides on how to do all of this stuff and where, where the placement is, and, and even who's a good candidate, right? They're, they're start, I mean, I guess a lot of this stuff is, um, I'm gonna say it's hit or miss. I don't, I don't know that there, there's certainly not one location, um, but it also depends on what type of models, you know, if there's um, more artistic representations of things versus more uh, mechanical representations of things. In the direction of <laughs> of the uh, the War Museum and historical reference, um, we have called museums to our recently where they have some models that bring their three dimensional images into a three dimensional frame, so the blinds are just really neat, and it's kind of like a hand drawn frame. And um, Smithsonian had a huge project a few years ago, so they have a lot of objects, and those are in a Creative Commons license um, educational use, where you can print objects from their collection. We printed a small version of the Abraham Lincoln life plan. So objects like that are also out there in some other projects. Yeah, um, I had a student actually a couple of years ago in my Roman Civ class do his final project, um, and part of that he he th came in and 3D printed a, a model of a Roman temple, which which was great. Um, and sort of just thinking about using the new technologies with with students who want to do projects um, that you know produce sorts of hands-on things. Do you have any sorts of guidelines about? Developing those projects with those students because this isn't obviously like the term maybe you can dash out the night before um, Do you do you have something in place? Are you working on that or so so we have kind of instructions about how to prepare a model like what what does what does a printable model have to consist of? Um, you know it needs to be a, a watertight mesh um, with uh, the so every polygon on a, on a model has a, a, a direction and so that you can have what's called inverted normals um, so the software that actually interprets a model for 3D printing tends to take some liberties because they're anticipating that something's going to be wrong with the model, and it'll try to repair things. And so, um, I'm I'm going to say to to answer the question, really giving yourself enough time to do an iterative design and create process. Uh, we definitely have people that fly by the seat of their pants and just have to take what comes out of the printer. And sometimes that's even okay, right? Like, well, my my goal was to print this Roman temple, and what I really printed was this blob of plastic, you know. So take it or leave it. Um, but uh, we do. So we have we have a couple of library guides uh, written about how to prepare a model, what you know, what you should look for in a model, um, things, thinking about printability. Like some things just don't they don't lend themselves well to being printed, and then knowing the the type of printing process that you should go for. So um, the ProJet 160 that we have that prints in powder. Uh, the whole print is encased in powder, and then you excavate and take out the extra material. That extra material is support for things that are, you know, if, if, you've got, if you've got something that comes up and then goes over, you have all this extra powder that you take out from underneath. Whereas with plastic, there actually has to be plastic that's built up in there. Um, now the software takes care of designing the support materials so it's algorithmically generated, 
Um, so you don't have to like think about when you're modeling where are my supports going to be. But you do want to think about the interface between support material and that kind of thing. So um, I mean, as far as going from you know assignment to print, I think there's some steps in there that I'm not totally clear on. You know, what what kinds of assignments really lend themselves well to uh, a print? But giving yourself enough time. Well, I guess there's also the consideration of you know is 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 this something that that the the student just pays for a print uh, and does it kind of the foolproof way, or do they want to actually learn how to use a printer, which I mean, I always encourage people to learn how to use a printer, um, but it definitely requires like sitting down and taking the time and, uh, and kind of learning how the machine works and how to process, you know, wh what kinds of things work and don't work. Uh, hi. So I know you said that you like to let people just try things. You really try hard not to say no. Yes. I'm curious though if you have a policy about things that are absolutely not going to be printed and if you have any printers that people can just come in and use without guidance, how do you monitor that if you have things that you really just are not okay to print? So there, there are materials um, that we don't like to print. Um, but th I guess the, the challenge here is that a policy really should say, I will not print with this material at a higher temperature than this, right? I mean, that's because there's so much variability here. So, I mean, PLA is a really safe material to use, but if you print PLA at 230 degrees Celsius, it's going to stink really bad and cause a lot of smoke to develop. Um, so, but there are things. Um, so we had students that came in with some, some wood filament, and when you start blending filaments in your hot end, you get you get weird mixtures and bad things happen. Um, so we we ask students not to print with exotic materials. Um, definitely things that have uh, carbon infusion. So there's all kinds of polycarbonate filaments where they mix polycarbonate something with PLA um, or with ABS. So it, it makes it a stronger print material, but the carbon um, will degrade the hot ends really quickly. So they're aluminum hot ends, and when they're at 200 degrees Celsius, you start scraping it with some, some carbon, and soon, soon your soon your very finely machined 0.35 millimeter extruder nozzle turns into a 0.45 extruder, you know, a 0.45 millimeter extruder nozzle, and you don't know why, and you can't tell where the damage is, and then you just have to replace parts. So we don't allow people to print with exotic filaments. Um, writing policy, on the other hand, is really difficult to like nail these things down because it's a moving target. Because you know you can't print, so I can say I don't want users to print with a polycarbonate, but I also don't want them to not bring in you know a new filament like uh, PETG is a newer filament that's you know it kind of takes the benefits of PLA and ABS without the offgassing. Like there's tons of there's there's I mean we want to encourage people to bring in new things because then we learn from those things. Um, so usually what we do is is. Uh, the other part of your question was, do we have machines that people can just come in? Yes, we have the, the three printers that are in, in the Knowledge Commons. There's no vetting process. Uh, so someone could come sit down knowing nothing and like demolish the printer and I would just deal with that. It, the thing is, users don't really do those types of things. I mean, mist uh, and, and the, other, the other, I guess the other part is somebody who really knows the printer can still hurt it, right? We're, we're finding new ways to damage our equipment all the time. Um, but because they're, they're open, it's open source hardware, uh, all of the pieces are, you know, I've, I've rebuilt printers over and over and over and over. And so, I mean, you get really good at it and you, it's, I mean, it, it helps us to translate, you know, how, how can we learn from this. And so we're, uh, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in learning and helping students learn than I am in kind of making sure that this happens in a very structured way. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of, I guess I, I feel a strong incentive not to overbuild because then it, you reduce, uh, and the, the possible applications. So. Oh, I see. No, I, I, yeah, the, the legally you can, I, I haven't, I mean, I think the more, the more, uh, the more dicey prints are things that people are offended by. I mean, the gun thing is, I, I, I mostly stay out of it. I mean, I don't, I don't care what people use it for. But we've printed some, like, I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the cutoff? Like, airsoft parts, yes. Guns, no. Um, I, I don't worry about it. 
well, I've never, I've never, uh, there is the copyright consideration. So somebody brought in a, a model and they're like, well, here's the original and I just, I just want to make a copy of this thing. And I'm like, well, like it's got a patent number on it. Like I'm just, I'm just not going to touch that. Like we, we tell them no. Um, that doesn't stop them. Like if, if they go ahead and, and do it by themselves, I'm not going to like, you know, come and, and loom over them. But um, we have, we have rejected print jobs uh, on the grounds of, of copyright. Um, but yeah, as far as uh, well, I, I think something models, I especially know. about that is um, I think we had a very basic discussion, and I think PJ is right that we have avoided putting really strict parameters on that, other than sort of being cautious because this exists as both a service and as a tool. So if someone wants to come in, I mean, I don't think any of us are kind of leaning over the scanners going like, oh, that's more than enough of that book. Um, so we don't want to operate that way about the printers either, but we want to avoid being the person who pushes the button and letting people have that freedom to take it however far they feel comfortable. As t in terms of a service, I think that's where really, if we're seeing patent numbers or it's like, here's my Mickey Mouse bus, make me another Mickey Mouse bus, that's where we are saying like, we can clearly see that we are, we're pushing a boundary where we'd rather be pushing other, other boundaries. Um, we have reached our time and I want everyone to get lunch, but I also wanted to say that TJ and I have uh, pushed our makerspace a little bit, so it will open today at uh, noon. So if any of you have a break um, for during the lunch break and want to stop by, ask us more questions, see a few things, we have a lot of samples, we'll pull everything out. You can shake our hand, um, or all of our hands. I don't know where the green one is. Um, but we'll be upstairs on the second floor in the Knowledge Commons space, so we'd love to kind of uh, take that there and give every, everybody an opportunity to eat lunch.